The Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All the scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly equipped unto all good works. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Matthew 10.30, even all the hairs on your head are numbered. Isaiah 41.10, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. Throw off your old sinful nature, the old sin nature, and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. You see, Judas had the best pastor, the best leader, the best advisor, the best counselor, and yet he failed. The problem is not the leadership or the church you go to. If your attitude or character doesn't change, or your heart doesn't transform, you will always be the same. Romans 10, 9 to 10. 9 Verse 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Verse 10, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. First John 2, 15 says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. Verse 16, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. Verse 17, The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. In preparation for our study of the Word of God today, the next few moments will be devoted to silent prayer, the objective of which is to make sure that we are filled with the Holy Spirit as we approach the Word of God. So silent prayer gives you the privacy of the priesthood and makes the option of rebound possible, if necessary. But for you, unbeliever, the issue you're facing is not rebound, not confession, but faith alone in Christ alone. Therefore, let us pray. <clears throat> Father, we are indeed grateful to you for the privilege of having the freedom to assemble ourselves together once again in this Bible study through the YouTube to focus our attention upon your word, which is forever a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you that you have preserved your word in writing for it, both in the original languages as well as in translation. You have provided the activated human spirit for faith perception of doctrine. You have provided God the Holy Spirit who is the ultimate teacher and the gift of pastor teacher for communication of doctrine so that every believer can consume the oxygen of the spiritual life, your word, 
and growth from infancy to adolescence and from adolescence on to maturity and fulfill the purpose for which you have left every believer in this life. And uh, we know, Father, the greater knowledge of doctrine, the greater the growth. The greater the blessing, the greater impact. The greater production of divine good, the greater reward in the eternal state. And there is every benefit and no detriment in growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so as we approach the study of your word, we ask that you open our hearts <clears throat> to the truth that we may fulfill that divine mandate of spiritual growth. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Good day, everyone. Welcome once again to our Bible study through the YouTube of the Vic Balbido Evangelistic Ministry. And uh, so today we have another uh, topic to... Uh, discuss another lesson to uh, study and this is of course still basic doctrine and uh, the title of our lesson is what must I do to be saved okay what must I do to be saved first of all in uh, first Peter 2 1 and 2, and 2 Peter 3, 18. God's Word mandates every believer to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we already know the three levels of spiritual growth, namely, baby believer, adolescent believer, and mature believer. Now, in James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. This talks about faith without works is dead. It is dealing not with salvation faith, not with the soteriological faith, but with phase two faith. You see, there are three phases of the plan of God. This is a review. Phase one, salvation. Acts 16, 31. Phase two, Believer in time, Second Peter 3.18. And phase three, believer in eternity, Revelation 21.4. Now, phase one faith is activated faith in the soul. It is activated by positive volition. Now, all members of the human race have faith as part of the essence of the soul. They do a lot of things by faith every single day. Most people sit down and eat and uh, believers with some knowledge of the Word of God usually pray and ask God's blessing on the food they eat. Everybody has faith as part of the essence of the soul. But in salvation, Faith is directed toward the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is activated faith. And it is activated by positive volition. Now, that's phase one of the plan of God. And one sixtieth of a second after somebody has accepted Christ as Savior, he immediately now moves into phase two of the plan of God. And phase two of the plan of God extends at the moment of salvation represented by the cross, as far as the church age is concerned, through death or the rapture, whichever occurs first. If it is death, the believer goes out either the sin unto death or dying grace. Now, if it is the rapture of the church, of course we know, First, it's Thessalonians. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and that we who are alive and remain 
shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. But whichever comes first, the believer then moves into phase three in the plan of God, which is eternal state. Now, salvation faith, soteriological faith, is faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. But phase two faith is the faith of the faith rest life, which means now faith is directed toward knowledge of Bible doctrine knowledge of the Word of God. So, there is a parallel here in the principle of appropriation. Faith is the mechanism of the acquisition of eternal life. This results in the acquisition of eternal life. Faith in phase two means that God imputes grace blessing to the believer in phase two spiritual blessing and temporal blessing. In phase one, faith on the Lord Jesus Christ means the believer is delivered from the lake of fire. In phase two, faith of the faithless life means the believer is delivered from divine discipline which is the byproduct of negative volition toward the word. And James 2, 14 to 26, is not describing phase one faith, but rather phase two faith. Okay? Is that clear? I will repeat. James 2, 14 to 26, is not describing phase one faith, but rather phase two faith. And it says that if a believer has activated faith, he is going to automatically produce divine good, called in the context here as good works. If the faith is activated by positive volition, it's going to result to the production of divine good. If the faith is not activated by positive volition, then it is deactivated or neutralized by negative volition resulting in the production of human good, which means dead works. And therefore, there is an equation we will look at in a moment, okay? Okay, here again is the cross. Just imagine the cross. Picture in your mind the cross representing the point of salvation. On the left side of it is a uh, top circle which encloses the union with Christ. Once that person who hears the gospel believes in Christ using his uh, volition, positive volition, then God the Holy Spirit picks him up and puts him in union with Christ forever. That is eternal relationship. So these are things that happened at that moment, he possesses eternal life. He becomes a member of the royal family of God. He is imputed God's perfect righteousness. He is positionally sanctified. He is elect, predestined. He is now a believer priest, etc. And cannot lose that relationship. On the bottom circle, is what we call temporal fellowship with God. Well, of course, this uh, describes this operation bottom circle, temporal fellowship with God. The feeling of the Holy Spirit redeeming the time. God's spiritual rest. Now here is where the believer is walking in light. He is walking in truth. He is walking by faith. And here, because the believer is walking in fellowship, it means, listen, listen here, there is no evil in his life. Did you hear that? There is no evil in his life. There is no mental attitude sin. There is no motivational sin. There is no lingual sin. There is no 
overt sin. So there is no sin in his life, which means he has a relaxed and powerful mental attitude because he has doctrinal orientation, doctrinal objectivity, doctrinal confidence, and doctrinal courage. And get this. The greater the knowledge of doctrine the believer possesses, the greater the doctrinal confidence and the greater the spiritual self-esteem. In doctrinal orientation, he's going to have an in life. And the greater the category one suffering he's going to have, the greater the intensity of it. That is suffering according to the will of God. Compassion suffering for the salvation of unbelievers, for the spiritual growth of believers. A believer who loves the word of God, the happiness and the love is so fulfilling and so wonderful that he wants all other believers to have the same thing. So now he has compassion suffering for other believers. To get plugged into the Word, because he wants them to have the same spiritual blessing that he has. He wants them to have the same divine viewpoint, historical impact, and ministry that every believer functions with doctrine he has in phase two. He wants them protected from evil in life. He wants their problem solved and problem prevented. That is compassion suffering. And God tests this believer. Sometimes he tests him through prosperity. Sometimes he tests him through adversity. Sometimes he tests him through both. And then there is testing or suffering that comes from the evil of others, the evil of unbelievers, the evil of reversionistic believers, the evil of Satan and the demons. But because the believer is in fellowship with God here, this is what we call the branch and divine analogy of John 15, 1 through 7. Therefore, he is productive of fruit. It's called the production of divine good. In John 15, it's called fruit. In 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15, it's called gold, silver, and precious stones. In the context here, it's called good works. It's divine good. And divine good is related to the fulfillment of the will of God and related to, at the same time, spiritual love, because divine good means it's the highest and the greatest good in which the believer not only acts in his own best interest by the execution of the will of God, his adjustment to the righteousness of God and justice of God, to the omniscience of God, to the sovereignty of God, to all aspects of divine essence. But he is adjusted to the standards of the Word of God through knowledge of the Word. And therefore, he acts in his own best interest and he acts in the best interest of others. That is divine good. That's the greatest good for the greatest number. And because he produces divine good, he automatically, well, he has divine viewpoint, historical impact on himself because every act of divine viewpoint Every act of faith, every act of positive volition and courage empowers the believer to keep on going and produces momentum in his own soul. But he also has divine viewpoint, historical impact and influence on others, which means he influences unbelievers to accept Christ as Savior and he influences other believers. He influences other believers who are functioning with a faithless life to keep on going and doing the right thing. And this is the kind of believer that God uses. Now, there is an equation. 
This is still related to faith and deliverance. Every unbeliever has the ability to believe that is faith resident in the soul. And in salvation, the object of the believer's faith is the Lord Jesus Christ. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's Acts 16, 30 and 31. The answer comes, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. In salvation, faith is directed toward the Lord Jesus Christ. And Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation on any other under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's only one way to get eternal life, and that is faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other way to get eternal life. It's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That is salvation. Now in phase two, we have the believer in Jesus Christ who still has faith resident in his soul. In other words, he still has the ability to believe. But now, the object of his faith is changed from one portion of Scripture. And the one portion of Scripture in salvation is every portion of Scripture related to the gospel message. But he has passed through that barrier. He has already trusted Christ as his Savior. Now, the object of the believer's faith becomes the totality of the Word of God, dispensationally, and I will add, categorically understood. You see, nobody can understand the Bible if it is not understood categorically. So categorical Bible, the believer's faith is directed toward the Word of God. It starts with understanding the doctrine of divine essence. What is God like? And then the barrier. The doctrine of soteriology, then the doctrine of eternal security, and then the doctrine of understanding spirituality and carnality and divine discipline and rebound and the faithless life and so on. That is basic Bible doctrine. Now, with the unbeliever, we'll take him up first. Here is the stimulus of the plan of God presented to the unbeliever. It is the gospel message. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Christ died in spiritual death for the sins of all members of the human race on the cross. 1 John 2.2 2, He is the propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Hebrews 2.9, He tasted death for every man. 2 Corinthians 5.14, We must conclude that if one died for all, so we call a first-class condition in the Greek, which means it is true. If one died for all, and it's true that he died, and all is spiritually dead, it is also true that all members of the human race are born spiritually dead. So, Christ died for the sins of all. Now, in and of itself, that didn't save anybody. What it did was to provide salvation for everybody. But eternal life is a gift. And like any gift, it is free to the recipient of the gift because the provider has paid the total price. So, salvation is free to the human race. Why? Because Christ did all the work on the cross. But, like any gift in life, the individual who is the intended recipient of the gift that is involved must make the decision to receive the gift. And that's a matter of freedom. You see, the one who is the intended recipient of a gift 
has the choice as to whether or not he's going to accept or reject the gift. And when the gift is given, a true gift is given with no strings attached. Otherwise, it's not a gift. It's an exchange. It's a bargaining gift. But the true gift has no strings attached. There's nothing that has to be given, in other words, in return, if it is a true gift. A true gift means the giver has paid the total price and the recipient is totally free without any other conditions to either accept or reject the gift. Understand? And that is why Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, Salvation is a gift of God. It's not of works, in order that no member of the human race may brag about it. So here is the provision of salvation. And this is the stimulus to all members of the human race. Now, all unbelievers, all members of the human race, including believers, of course, have volition, the freedom of choice, right? Volition has two poles, positive and negative pole. The desire pole and the non-desire pole, the softness pole and the hardness pole, the honesty pole and the dishonesty pole. And listen, if the unbeliever, he receives knowledge of the gospel message, it goes into the mentality of his soul. He has faith, resident as the appropriator of the soul. And when this information, gospel information, goes into the mentality of his soul, then God, the Holy Spirit, causes the unbeliever to comprehend it, to understand it, to perceive it. At the same time, God, the Holy Spirit, shows the unbeliever that this is the true way of salvation. It is the truth. And he convicts the unbeliever of the unpardonable sin. And this is cycled here in the command post of the soul, the volition of the unbeliever. And because he understands it, it is therefore a stimulus to which he has to respond. And he does respond. He either responds positively or he responds negatively. But the unbeliever understands if the information is given to him. If the gospel message is communicated to the unbeliever in a language which the unbeliever understands, then the unbeliever faces it as a stimulus and he is in the fork of the road and he has to take it. He either has to respond positively and accept Christ as Savior, or he has to respond negatively and reject Christ as Savior. There is no third option. Now, unbelievers who are negative sometimes throw up a third option. I don't understand what you're telling me. I'm not smart enough to understand it. I don't talk about religion or politics. What about the heathen in Africa? These are all smoke screens to try to get that proverbial monkey off the back of the unbeliever so he doesn't have to face the spiritual pain that's going through in his soul. And the pain is that he is convicted of the unpardonable sin. And it is a painful thing for people who are negative toward Christ, that is, unbelievers who are negative toward Christ to face the reality of their own hardness of heart and change their attitude. But when they are informed that their negative volition, the rejection of Christ as Savior is going to send them to the lake of fire, it is that threat, that warning of punishment that maximizes the pain as designed to bring about an avoidance procedure called using the fire escape. It is painful for the unbeliever to be convicted of the unpardonable sin. 
even though he knows the gospel message is the truth. It is more intensely painful for the unbeliever to be warned about going to the lake of fire and spending eternity there. However, it is most painful for an unbeliever to wind up there. So the threat, the warning about the lake of fire and the warning of the unpardonable sin cause pain and discomfort to unbelievers. That is why they have all kinds of smoke screens that they throw up. Like, I don't talk about religion and politics, or mind your own business, or I'm not interested. Well, remember, the day will come when every unbeliever is going to be interested. Did you hear me right? Negative volition is not going to go on forever. It halts at death to the unbeliever. Luke 16, 19 to 31. Remember the rich man at his death? Had a great funeral, naturally because he was wealthy. They wanted to honor the memory of him, especially those who inherited his wealth. But the dead rich man, who was an unbeliever, whose body was there. And they had a funeral, and they buried him and mourned for 30 days. But he's been mourning for 30 days in torments, and he's only getting it worse. That rich man went to torments because he rejected Christ as Savior. Not because he was wealthy. He left his wealth behind on the earth. And now he is eternally poor. And he has two requests. You may recall, or you may not recall, from Luke 16, he wants Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and touch his tongue. He said, I am constantly tormented in this place with pain and I am dehydrated. You know how it's like to be dehydrated? It's very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable. And what was his second request? His second request is, send Lazarus back. That is his second request to Abraham. Send Lazarus back to my father's house because I've got five brothers, lest he also come to this place of torture or torment. Now he is compassionate. He knows two things. Number one, it's too late for him. And number two, it's not too late for his brothers. But he knows if his brothers now, this rich man in torments, and it's true of all unbelievers in torments, they have a very clear understanding of the issue of the gospel. It's absolute. It's in their face. They know that if they don't accept Christ as Savior on the earth, any unbeliever is going to wind up in the same place, in torments. And unbelievers in torments don't want anybody else to come there. It's an incidentally, there is a passage in Ecclesiastes dealing with things on the earth versus things in the afterlife, in the eternal state, that says, the dead know nothing. Now we will not try this time to digress into the passage, but it's a guarantee. The uh, dead had no hold a lot more than the dead on the face of the earth. The dead know nothing, and which means something in the context in Ecclesiastes. And it doesn't mean that they don't know anything, because for example, here's the rich man in Luke 16, 19 through 31. And by the way, this is not a parable. Because why? Because proper names are never used in parables, ever. This can be easily substantiated in the New Testament parables. And Lazarus' name is used in that account. This is a true account. 
It's not a simple story that Christ developed to teach a point of doctrine. He is teaching all kinds of points of doctrine. But Luke 16, 19 to 31 is not a parable. Please understand that. In fact, it's not referred to as a parable. So, this rich man is going to torments. And that is the warming up spot for the great white throne judgment. And from there to the lake of fire where the unbeliever is tormented day and night, forever and ever. Now, therefore, the threat, the conviction of the unpardonable sin of remaining negative in rejection of Christ as Savior, produces great discomfort and stress to the soul of the unbeliever. And it is designed by God the Father and in the convicting ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, to accomplish that. You and I do not lead anybody to Christ. It is God, the Holy Spirit, who does it. We give the message, yes. The believer is the working. He is working for the divine post office to deliver the message. The male, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You and I are powerless to cause an unbeliever to understand the gospel message or the convicting of the unpardonable sin. This is supernatural and God the Holy Spirit does it and He always does it when the gospel is presented. And we are going to continue in our discussion on this tomorrow. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity of listening to your word, especially on that great salvation. We thank you for sending to us your only begotten Son and for becoming our substitute in paying for our sins. And now, as your children, we pray that you will guide us in our Christian life, that we may be able to attain our spiritual goal, which is spiritual maturity, the capacity stage. Thank you for all of this, in Christ's name. Amen.